for the second part of the morning session. Uh, the first speaker is Gerd Loiks from the MPI from Max Planck Institute in Erlangen, um, who's going to talk to us about the science of light. So thank you very much for coming. And Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for bringing me here. Thank you for the invitation. I um, appreciate being a part of uh, this group and um, witnessing the start of this uh, promising new center. So the Signs of Light is the title of our uh, institute and I'll um, show you um, a number of experiments, projects, mostly related to the nanoparticle light coupling, where nanoparticle can also be atom. And um, I uh, uh, will start out by um, talking about the most simple process that we have, most simple non-trivial process we have in quantum optics, which is uh, the spontaneous emission of an excited state. So that uh, eventually will lead to a ground state and a photon um, propagating uh, to infinity. Um, since this is unitary evolution, of course, it should be reversible. Um, but the reversibility of this process in free space has not been um, uh, demonstrated um, so far. When you want to do this, um, you have to deal with all aspects of optics and quantum optics, and that is the spatiotemporal uh, properties of the wave functions, which are given by Maxwell's equation, and the quantum excitations that you get when you quantize the light field. Light field. So you have both these aspects, the vector, spatiotemporal uh, vector properties of uh, the mode, which are more classical, because basically they're given by Maxwell's equation, are or on the left side here. Um, we can also characterize field distributions. This is all more on this classical um, uh, side. And then when you talk about exciting and uh, looking at the dynamics of a single atom, characterizing the optical response of nanoparticles, this uh, is then more or less on the, on the quantum side. So what I will do, I will start out with uh, this question of a single atom interacting with weak light in, in free space. Uh, then I go on to tell you about a nano beacon, which is a little bit more towards uh, the classical part. The uh, spatial properties play a bigger role in this case. Uh, then I'll tell you about the Möbius strip in optics, which is uh, uh, in kind of Maxwell optics uh, domain. Um, then I very briefly will tell you about uh, our plans to go to quantum repeater. And uh, at the end, I'll give you an advertisement. Um, okay. So let's uh, start with single atom in free space. Um, when you talk about this, it might be good to um, recall all the great successes in uh, cavity QED, and some of the pioneers in this field are sitting in this room. Um, we heard earlier this week that there is this cooperativity parameter, and in cavity QED you have strong coupling. If this coupling constant G is larger than the spontaneous decay, and if it's also larger than the cavity decay constant, so then you're in this uh, strong coupling uh, regime. In free space, you cannot go there because strong coupling regime basically means that a light that has interacted with the atom will come back. In free space, this uh, does not happen. Um, but this uh, factor, this cooperativity factor, despite of the fact that it has a cavity decay time, it also works if you don't have a cavity. Uh, it's just a geometric factor. You can also call it, uh, this is equivalent, this cooperativity parameter is equivalent to the probability of absorption in a single flyby of the light field times the number of flybys. And in free space, of course, this is one, and um, the maximum that you can get is a probability here of one, so this is limited to one. But this, you could say, is efficient, very efficient coupling, and this also has its virtues, partly because it is broadband, the bandwidth of the field is not um, modified by the um, cavity. 
Um, so the quest here is that if you have an atom and you expose it to light, sometimes it does not get excited, but uh, sometimes uh, it does. And uh, the question is, the, uh, what is the absorption probability, how the probability for scattering backward, forward, backward scattering is reflection, how about the phase shift that is imposed, and uh, is it possible to go to the extremes? So basically, in this problem, single atom in free space interacting with weak light fields, there are um, three problems, that, basic problems that you can identify. You can ask how much of a phase shift can a single atom impose on a coherent light beam? Um, how big can the reflection be? And also, can a single photon wave packet fully excite um, an atom? That was kind of uh, what I hinted at uh, with this time reversal symmetry argument that this should be the case. So this is 100%, this should also be 100%, and this should be 180%. Uh, let's look at this phase shift a bit more closely. So initially you have an incoming uh, light field from all sides in 3D. Um, a two-level atom is sitting in the center. Um, now, uh, in this case, it's trivial that all light is back reflected uh, because what goes in comes out. Um, and, uh, uh, but the phase shift that it can impose is, uh, in this geometry, is uh, 180 degrees, which is uh, quite a lot, phase shift imposed by a single atom. Uh, but in order to get this uh, at least close to full uh, 4 pi full solid angle access to the atom, um, we work with a deep parabolic mirror. We use... Uh, um, so for the main experiment, we also use double trap, but I'm not talking about this here. Uh, for the main, um, main project, we trap uh, a single ion with the electrodes all on one side, so that ensures wide optical access. Um, if we uh, um, arrange things such that we excite a linear dipole where the axis is along the parabolic axis, then the pattern for emission or absorption, the, the um, uh, spatial uh, angular pattern uh, lies like this, so it's kind of like a um, like a, uh, so this has rotational symmetry around the uh, parabolic um, uh, axis. So you can see that even a parabolic mirror, which is kind of wide open here, so the depth it's fairly deep. So the depth is like five to six times the uh, focal the focal length, um, but still it has a wide opening here, but with this uh, geometry um, we don't uh, lose uh, so much. So now the experiment for the phase shift that I want to um, tell you about, this just came out uh, a few weeks ago in the journal run by uh, the previous speaker whose uh, presentation I admired. So here is the parabolic mirror, here's the iron. Um, this, uh, this is the light field driving the, uh, um, the main, the resonant uh, uh, excitation. Um, we use this partly for uh, laser cooling the ion, um, and we can shift here, turning the half wave plate, we can guide the light one way or the other. But we can also uh, send it by this acoustic optic modulator, which uh, gives a shift of uh, two times uh, 200 uh, megahertz. And then out comes here now to uh, the carrier and the 400 megahertz sideband. So then uh, the sideband can be um, close to the resonance of the ion, and we can shift this a bit. And as a reference, we have the uh, uh, carrier, which is 400 megahertz away. And then we can look at the beat and compare the phase shift of the beat with the uh, beat that we have from the acoustic modulator. Um, and this is how. Uh, and fortunately, the optical phase shift survives when you um, mix it down to uh, um, radio frequencies. So this is the phase shift that we measure. And the uh, results that we have uh, so far um, are like this. So we have like something like two and a half degrees uh, phase shift imposed by the single ion onto uh, the um, coherent light field. This, uh, 
This is the level scheme uh, of the ethereum signal and as the ethereum that we uh, use. So here, uh, the coupling strengths uh, we uh, uh, we indicate by this capital G. Uh, so this is in this case was a was around about uh, 10, 12 percent, and um, so we know what to do to increase this further. Um, and for many applications, it's not um, absolutely necessary to go very close to 180 degrees, but if one would have like 10, 20 degrees, this would already uh, make a lot of uh, um, yeah, experiments possible. Um, just to show you what other people have done, um, let's concentrate on phase shift. Um, there is uh, a three degree measurement by, uh, by its Sandoff-Das group, uh, this was when he was still at uh, Zurich and at ETH. ETH. This, um, uh, he didn't use an ion, he used a molecule in a cryogenic matrix. Um, so this is slightly higher, but all the others, uh, Kotsifa and the blood group, these are all smaller phase shifts uh, that uh, they have seen. So with our first result, we are very close to the state of the art. We hope to soon go uh, beyond this. Okay, so, um, so this was the first, we'll come back to this. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, towards the end of my talk. But now um, I want to tell you about the uh, nano beacon and steering uh, light uh, scattering. So that's the next uh, topic. And for this, I want to take you back to the basics, um, to total internal reflection. So if you send a light beam towards an interface from the um, more dense optical medium, and if you look what happens at the interface, uh, we know that uh, there has to be some field on the other side called the evanescent field, and uh, this is all uh, nice and well understood. There is this ghost Hansian shift, and there are all kinds of interesting um, aspects associated uh, with this. But there's one thing that for a long time I had missed, and this is the polarization of the evanescent uh, uh, wave. Uh, if you, uh, so the, uh, there is a phase shift uh, at total internal reflection which is polarization dependent. If you look at the polarization is, which is perpendicular, not this one shown here, but the other one perpendicular to the screen, this is the same everywhere, it doesn't change, it factors out, so nothing new, it's like a scalar problem. Not so for this polarization, if this in-plane polarization, because in this propagating beam this will be uh, transverse. Um, also on the outgoing beam. That means in this overlap region, you overlap two fields which have an angle, may even have close to 90 degrees. And they have a phase shift. And as a result, you have elliptical polarization. But this is elliptical polarization of an unusual kind. Normally, when you have the um, light beam going in this direction, then circular polarization will be electric field vector that rotates like this, or it will be elliptical if my length of my arm will change while I rotate. Uh, whereas this here um, is, uh, is different. Uh, here we will have an elliptical rotation in a plane which contains the uh, wave uh, vector. So this is a elliptical polarization which rotates like this. If this again is the k-vector, it will rotate like this. And the angular momentum vector points now in the transverse direction. So normally for circular polarization and for orbital angular momentum modes, the angular momentum vector always points forward, parallel to the k-vector. Now in this particular case in the evanescent wave, if you excite it in this way, you have transverse angular momentum. Not so common. Um, on the uh, side of uh, the medium where the light uh, propagates, where the light is coming from, um, oops, it's falling to pieces. Um, there, of course, you have different kinds of polarization. In between, there's also linear polarization because you have different uh, um, uh, interference conditions depending on the path difference between the incoming and the reflected uh, beam. But in the uh, evanescent wave, there's this one polarization persistent uh, um, and the k-vector parallel to the surface. Now, um, when you look at this and if you think, okay, so in the evanescent wave you have preferentially such a, uh, such a, uh, such a rotating field is associated with 
with this particular uh, incoming and outgoing um, light field on the other side. If you now replace this here by a dipole which has a spinning, which produces a spinning field just spinning in this direction, this will preferentially emit only in this direction. So you have some steering. Likewise, if you do the, uh, if you look at the other situation where the light is not coming from the bottom left but from the bottom right, then you have a similar ellipse, but now it's rotating in the other direction. So the way to remember this is just rotating opposite to how a wheel would, would roll. So if you say, okay, here you have the K vector from left to right, a wheel would roll like this, the electric field is just opposite. And same here, so this is, uh, I want to memorize this. So if you replace this by a spinning dipole which spins in the opposite direction, so then you have the emission um, to, uh, to the left. So, um, and this is transverse, uh, uh, transverse uh, light field. Transverse light field also um, happens in uh, propagating uh, light modes. And this here shows a light field which has a um, special um, polarization property. The vector properties are not linear or circularly polarized, they are radially polarized. So locally linear, but uh, pointing in the radial direction. Needless to say, this is a donor mode with a zero intensity on axis. When you focus this, this forms uh, by bending the light beams to the focus, or the electric field vectors bend forward, and on axis you will have a strong longitudinal field component. So in microwaves, one knows this as a transverse uh, magnetic field. This is called that way because the electric field is not transverse, it has longitudinal components. And free space, when you focus, you can have something uh, similar. Um, and, but in the region around the focus, you still have uh, transverse uh, radial polarization uh, components. Um, so, um, when you take such a mode uh, and focus it down in a microscope objective, then have some object here, object plane, maybe a small gold bead, um, or molecule or atom or whatever, um, and then you collect uh, the light field with another objective, with some uh, um, immersion oil here to get to collect as much as possible, and then you have a camera, so then you can uh, look at the scattering of these small beads uh, from this uh, light field. Now we have this, the focus of this radial polarization, and I told you there's this longitudinal field component in the center, so this is indicated by Z, so it's pointing towards you. Uh, as you go, so this of course has a distribution, not exactly only on axis, so it's, it's distributed around the center. Uh, the optical axis, and um, in the outer region you have still uh, some of the original radial polarization, and there is a region of overlap. And now, again, you have the same thing. You have simultaneously electric field which is pointing in the longitudinal direction and pointing in the um, uh, transverse direction, uh, depending on where you are in different directions. And this produces also this strange transverse orbital angular momentum or this strange transverse angular momentum, I should say. So here it's more like a spin, transverse spin angular momentum. Um, and uh, uh, such that you have a transverse um, angular momentum uh, spinning like it is uh, indicated here. And now it's clear from what I showed you before, if you now put a little bead uh, somewhere, if you move it around uh, in this beam, or if you move the beam around, depending on where the little uh, nano antenna sits, it will uh, send light into one direction or in the other direction, and this uh, makes it possible to form um, uh, to form a nano beacon. Uh, so by moving this little 80 nanometer particle um, uh, in a, uh, around a circle which is, uh, has a diameter much less than the wavelengths, um, you see that the light is emitted um, in um, in different uh, directions. Um, so this is an interesting field that has uh, come up. Um, some people, um, uh, so this, the fact that there uh, was this strange polarization that was known, there, was a, there were two uh, French physicists, uh, Huard and Vigoureux, who in the 70s used this to produce circular polarized microwaves but they didn't use the fact of this uh, directional, uh, the correlation with the directional emission. Um, 
So we initially started out by uh, understanding that there's something special of, about, um, about transverse angular momentum. Um, at that time, not thinking about this uh, special effect near the surface. Um, this was uh, first uh, recognized uh, by uh, Zayats and Capasso, the group of Zayats, they did experiment and uh, theory in, pl in plasmonics, so that was kind of like a plasmonic version of this. And uh, Federico Capasso, who was a student, he did some uh, theory. And um, then we also combined um, uh, this and showed this, uh, our uh, nano beacon. And um, a group which does very nice uh, work, exactly centered in this direction, is Arno Rauschenbeutel. He also started out with a nano bead, but he has these um, uh, atom fiber atom traps. Um, not. Uh, um, not so different from uh, what we have seen before. And um, uh, there you have the same thing. In the uh, fiber, you also have uh, confinement but um, total internal um, reflection, and you have uh, this similar effect. So if you have an atom sitting out in the evanescent field, um, you can also send this uh, both directions. And then I don't have a citation here, but um, Peter Zoller published a paper uh, where uh, he said that uh, this could be nicely used to realize a quantum, um, um, a quantum network um, by having a way to tell the atom whether to send the light into the fiber to the left or to the right. Um, so this is uh, combining these more complex aspects of vector properties of the light field with, uh, with quantum optics. So the uh, next uh, topic is the Möbius trip. So this is now, this project has nothing to do with any quantum excitation. This is kind of looking at the special ve vector properties of um, uh, the light field um, uh, only. So it's characterizing uh, the field uh, distribution in a way with a kind of, you could say, revealing a hidden singularity. And uh, so again, um, in order the experiment looks uh, similar. Um, a collimating microscope objective, large numerical aperture, uh, 0.9, um, and a collecting uh, objective and, uh, and a camera. And uh, so the bead again, this is a gold bead of uh, 80 nanometer diameter. Um, so in such a situation, when uh, you uh, uh, modify uh, the light field such uh, uh, then so if you send in light field then you have the light that is directly transmitted and if you have the scatter you also have the forward scattered light field and the two interfere and this gives us the possibility to measure uh, phase and uh, uh, vector properties so we we can in relative to as a as a reference, we have this incoming light field, so we can, we can with this interference with the light, with the bead, uh, we can determine all the properties of um, uh, the light field. And um, so in uh, some more complex polarization distributions, you can have the situation that the intensity is more or less uniform, and that you have elliptically polarized light, but the eccentricity and the orientation of the ellipse uh, is uh, changing. So if you uh, illuminate this with the proper light field distribution, you can have something like this. Uh, this, um, um, in general, this was, uh, uh, s uh, such polarization singularities were uh, uh, referred to by uh, uh, Michael Berry, for example, in the 70s already. So the thing here is that you now, this is a singularity because you can have the situation that is depicted here, that um, there is elliptical polarization around a point where you have circular polarization. So in circular polarization, the direction of the ellipse is uh, not defined. So if the direction, um, the orientation of the ellipse is the quantity that you're interested in, this is kind of uh, undefined here, but defined all the way around. Um, and uh, um, depending um, on the situation, you can have different uh, scenarios. And it was someone from Barilan here, um, uh, Isaac uh, Freund. 
Um, so I've never met him. I meant to tell you, maybe, is he around? Yeah. yeah? He's not here, but he's here. Okay. Um, so um, he said, ah, if you look at this and you, uh, you go around this uh, singularity of circular polarization, this ellipse changes in a way that the ellipse only rotates like, makes a half rotation. Uh, so everything is continuous, all the field, fields are continuous, but if you kind of adiabatically follow the tip of the ellipse, you see that they don't match up, which you don't see when you look at the field because it's oscillating at an optical frequency in this direction, so it, it will be nicely... Um, it, uh, but in order to go back to, uh, to the original, uh, you have to go, go around this twice. So this, um, if, you, if you now plot the direction of the ellipse and the eccentricity, um, you uh, find that this looks a little bit like a Möbius strip. So this is the long axis of the ellipse indicating forward-backward. Um, and in order to visualize this a bit better, so this is the 3D and this, I think, should be the uh, projection on the on the table. Um, so, um, so this we did in collaboration with uh, um, Abraham Karimi who, and uh, Bob Boyd, who are both in um, Ottawa. Okay, very um, briefly, um, a quantum repeater. Um, Dieter Meschert already uh, told you um, a lot about the quantum repeater. Um, with this first experiment that I showed you, where we have um, the possibility to impose a phase shift on a coherent light field. Um, that gives us also the opportunity to build a quantum repeater without any uh, single photons or discrete excitations, but just uh, using a coherent light field on the, uh, on the optical uh, side. And the proposal to, for this quantum repeater came from the uh, uh, group of uh, Yoshi Yamamoto, uh, first author here is a bit of unlook, and uh, this is the scheme that was uh, um, basically uh, sketched already by um, um, Klaus Möllner. Uh, so what happens here, um, you have a coherent light field that first interacts with one atom, um, and then with a second atom, and uh, so it undergoes phase shifts, and then you can measure the phase shift with a homodyne um, detection is a homodyne measurement. So uh, the idea is if both these atoms initially are in the superposition of two uh, states, zero and one, and if the light field couples one of these states to some higher lying states, introducing a phase shift only uh, if the atom, um, and so the atom introduces a phase shift onto this uh, light field only if it is in the one state. So if this coherent light field is interacting with this uh, uh, atom in the uh, superposition state, um, as Klaus Mölmer um, mentioned already, then of course it's not a coherent state anymore. The two systems are entangled. You have an entangled coherent entanglement between the light field and the um, atom. So then there can be a phase shift or not, depending if you would measure a phase shift, you would see a phase shift or not. Then it goes through the second atom, then you can see two phase shifts, no phase shift, or one phase shift. If there's one phase shift, this is what you post select on and you don't know it, it, did the phase shift come from this or this atom, and if you post-select on this measurement, to, and you entangle these um, two um, uh, atoms. And with a phase shift, uh, uh, maybe slightly more than what we have now, um, this should be possible. At the moment, we basically have close to a two-level system um, uh, in, um, in, the, in our uh, apparatus. At least the ground state is degenerate. Um, but there are ytterbium um, isotopes which have, um, um, which have hyperfine structure which we could, uh, uh, could use for this. Um, the original scheme put forward by Peter van Loek looked like this. This is a copy from their paper. And what we plan to do is replace the cavities that they were using to have strong, efficient coupling, replace these by these uh, parabolic uh, mirrors. But uh, this uh, is in the future, and as Dieter pointed out, uh, this will take us about 10 years. The alternative is to go via satellite. Um, and many people are doing this. The first uh, paper from the Chinese satellite is just uh, coming out. Um, Thomas Yenevan in Canada has simulated a low Earth orbit satellite by flying um, 
uh, airplane um, where all the um, all the devices on the airplane were very similar to what you would have on a, a low Earth um, orbit uh, uh, satellite. Um, and um, uh, so you can see that there is uh, lots of things happening. Um, so we were lucky. We were in contact with um, a uh, group um, that is running this AlphaSat, a geostationary um, uh, satellite which carries this laser communication terminal that was built by the uh, company TESAT near Stuttgart in Germany and it's, uh, the satellite is owned by the German NASA DLR um, and so this was built to have optical, coherent optical communication between uh, uh, geostationary and low earth orbit satellites mainly but of course they can also connect to ground station but this is of course only possible if there is no cloud um, because it's optical. Uh, this is neodym Yag, one micron radiation there. Um, and um, so all the other projects uh, that uh, are also then related to quantum in different countries are low Earth orbits. Um, and so the thing is, this was not built with quantum in mind, um, but um, I'll show you um, why this might uh, uh, still work. But uh, first, I want to share with you why it at all makes sense to go to satellite, because if you can have a direct uh, link on Earth, this would probably be 2,000 kilometers here. Um, and uh, um, why would it make sense to go to a satellite? Uh, maybe if it's a low-flying low, uh, low satellite, it might make more sense, but such a high-flying satellite, can that make sense? And there is an interesting argument that you can give. The attenuation in a fiber, 3 dB, 20 kilometers, or the 1 over E.50 kilometers, so it scales as um, at, uh, uh, one, uh, 1 over 10.50 kilometer is the equivalent, more or less. Um, so the intensity in the fiber will drop off exponentially like this. Uh, in contrast, when uh, you have a light field, light source on the satellite and send the light field uh, down, um, then uh, the atten of course the beam is not attenuated, it's just spreading, but in the end you have a finite aperture, you will not be able to, because it's probably spreading to hundreds of meters, and uh, um, so you will not be able to catch all of this because the aperture is not high enough, so this is like an equivalent uh, attenuation. And this attenuation is just uh, associated with the um, um, uh, diffractional uh, expansion of the beam. So this scales as 1 over L squared, and we know this is much slower than exponential. So um, the 50 dB um, uh, you get in a fiber for a distance of 250 kilometers, and even if you go 40,000 kilometers to the uh, to this geostationary satellite and uh, look at what the attenuation here is, that now depends on the receiving optics. At the moment, this laser communication terminal has 20 centimeter diameter, uh, but if you would increase it to 60, which is not completely out of the world, it would be the same attenuation. And and of course, this is not in completely independent of the separation, more or less almost independent of the separation of the uh, ground stations here. Um, so this uh, shows you some of um, the, the different scaling that you have in these two uh, cases. So this uh, is a close-up look of this laser communication terminal with these uh, mounts, uh, kind of cardanic mount, so I think, uh, or what is it called, so that you can, uh, with uh, two mirrors, you can uh, rotate and point the beam in, uh, in all uh, directions. Um, so this is the uh, setup that they're using. There's a laser, so there's a receiver and a sender station on the laser communication terminal. Uh, so this is the sending station. There's a laser, there is an, um, an amplifier. Um, which of course means that this is not a coherent state that they emit there. And the amplifier, of course, because of uh, this huge loss, quote unquote, that you have if you have a finite um, aperture on the, on the ground or on the low Earth orbit, what they're 
essentially have in mind. And then you go down 40,000 kilometers, and in this case, so my group has uh, like three times already uh, gone to uh, the Canary Islands, and uh, they never asked me to come along, so I know this only from uh, pictures. Um, so we, um, we had some first results, which are in here, which I will show you. But first, I want to remind you what the uh, uh, what these optical com communication coherent uh, communication people had in mind when they were building this laser communication terminal. They wanted to not to look any quantum technology. They wanted to have reliable communication. So they were working with coherent states as far apart as possible, so that they could easily distinguish them. And the the nice thing is that this technology is very, very close to what one would need if you use um, continuous variable field quadrature technology in the, um, in the quantum domain. And so like for quantum key distribution, what you need is non-orthogonal um, non states, the Bennett 92 protocol, for example. So all you need is to attenuate um, these beams. Of course, I mean, this is uh, still a while until this uh, will, will work properly. We have this problem with this uh, large apparent attenuation. But what we have um, done is we said, okay, so if we have a mixed state because of the amplifier up at the satellite, when it comes down to close before the beam hits the Earth, it enters the atmosphere. So. It, the satellite is 40,000 kilometers away. The thickness of the atmosphere is only a few kilometers. So short before it hits the ground, it uh, enters the atmosphere. And if you start at like 10 kilometer height or so, and if you take a typical aperture that you also would have um, on, on Earth, then the attenuation is such that by attenuation, you come very close to a coherent state because the, the, uh, the quantum uncertainty scales only as... Uh, uh, one over the square root of the losses and the signal itself, the classical, the amplifier, the, 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 the excess noise of the amplifier scales as uh, uh, one over the losses. So this wins. So in a way, this is kind of like a poor man's approach to coherence by attenuation and maybe loosely linked to what Klaus Malmer said. Um, and so basically, we have a virtual source, which is uh, a quantum limited coherent uh, state. Um, when the beam enters the atmosphere, and then we can check what does the atmosphere do to the beam. Um, and so we measured for different separations, so we are sending plus alpha or minus alpha, and this is a histogram averaging over the plus and minus uh, alpha signals. So it's either this left signal or this right, uh, so the left signal or the right signal, but this is all a histogram of, of for for this whole ensemble of signals. And as you uh, decrease um, the separation of these two coherent states uh, around uh, uh, zero, around the vacuum, they come closer and closer. And now you can say, is there excess noise? And so for these uh, Gaussian states, it's kind of straight, straightforward. Uh, you have to compare it to the widths of a, a vacuum state. And um, so these are the measurements that we have done. The excess noise is very small, so within the error bar, more or less, this uh, coincides with what you expect from uh, zero um, excess noise. So that means the, um, the um, light field has uh, no big uh, detrimental effect. One interesting thing that um, comes up, and we don't really know at all where this might be going, but there are people in Vienna like uh, um, Ursin, what's his first name? Uh, Marin, you know? Uh, uh, so last name is Ursin, Professor, o Professor Ursin. So, so he is uh, thinking about um, uh, looking at uh, gravitation and quantum effects. And so maybe there's also a platform for looking uh, for something like this if you have a uh, source on a geostationary orbit far away from Earth where the gravitational field from the Earth is uh, fairly uh, low and then going um, down to the Earth so you go through a large part of the gradient of the Earth's uh, gravitational field. And the, um, the last technical slide that I wanted to show you is an advertisement. I promised you this advertisement and I put this in because of uh, 
Yakov uh, Shaket's uh, talk from the uh, Avis and uh, Michael's group. So we um, looked at the uh, best, the most efficient way to do tomography of a light field. So in this first paper, this was concentrating on Gaussian states, and the second paper here uh, concentrates on, uh, on uh, 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 addresses also non-Gaussian states. So let me tell you just very briefly of these Gaussian states. So uh, what we did is we said we do to, to, to do tomography. For example, you do homodyning, and you measure with various angles uh, in, the fa in phase space, you get your uh, input data for the, um, tomographic reconstruction, then you do the tomographic reconstruction and you get the Wigner function. Um, so we uh, used 100 million samples to do this. Um, maybe 20 different angles and uh, um, 5 million, um, five million uh, uh, times. Uh, altogether 100 million. And then we compare this to the alternative, which is to split up the beam and measure X and P simultaneously. And then you don't have to do any, uh, do, uh, you don't have to do any tomographic reconstruction. You just build up the histogram of the Q function. And uh, our expectation, or at least my expectation in Lishi was like what uh, Yakov also said, that when you have this extra input port where this uh, quantum uncertainty comes in, so this is not as good. And it turns out this is uh, this answer is not so uh, so clear. So we 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 compared this uh, tomographic reconstruction of the Wigner function with the tomographic re uh, reconstruction of the Q function. There we had the same number of samples, 100 million. So that gave us the 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 goal. And then we looked how how far when can we come if we use only 100, 500 thousand samples? How quickly does it converge? And for Gaussian states, the convergence is quicker by a factor of two if you do this double homodyning, or what some people call heterodyning, um, except for the vacuum state. This is this one. The vacuum state is different, but all the other states, squeeze states and uh, thermal states, this, it's, it's better to use uh, to, to measure the Q function uh, directly. Uh, Luis Sanchez Soto, where is he? Here. Um, he looked also at the case of Fox states, so for, uh, not only for the n equal zero, but also for the n equal one uh, state, the, um, uh, the, Q, the direct reconstruction of the Q function is not preferable, but it seems that for n larger than two, this is uh, better, but these, are not, these data are not finalized. Okay, so um, what I told you about was done in uh, my division and um, basically in the two groups of uh, these two group leaders, Christoph Marquardt and uh, Peter uh, Banzer, so, and uh, their whole team, but I showed you most of the references. And so in the last slide, let me show you the staircase that I um, have to walk up uh, every morning when I'm at home. And let's congratulate, uh, let's, uh, let me congratulate you again to your nice uh, center. <laughs>